A very good morning to you all and uh, a very happy Sabbath as well. The last dramatic days. Over the past 67 odd years, being my association with the Wangarei Seventh-day Adventist Church, firstly in Norfolk Street and thereafter here in God's Mill Road place of worship, I guess I have listened to approximately 3,400 odd sermons, many of them thought-provoking, uplifting, encouraging, challenging, etc. While not being critical, nevertheless, what I don't seem to recall is the number of sermons that were preached or based on the final dramatic days of Jesus Christ's mission to planet Earth to faithfully attend to the cost of mankind's salvation. For I feel they were maybe few and far between. Jesus' mission, as we know, was to give hope to every human being born into this world since the arrival of Adam and Eve. Now for those of you who were here last week, you would have been thoroughly blessed with Pastor Adrian's superb sermon on Jesus' last dramatic days. It was very wonderful and professional. For today, all I can contribute is a layman's version of the same subject. I didn't know it was going to work out this way, and I certainly could not have prepared a different sermon at such short notice. So this morning I thought it could be spiritually profitable to again briefly review Jesus' final days that were to pave the way for his promised future gift of eternal life to all who have acquainted themselves with him and in faith have loved him in personal relationship bonding but first, let's spend a moment or two to check out a few character traits that belong exclusively to the curriculum vitae, or CV, of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, loving and kind. Jesus Christ, merciful and long-suffering. Jesus Christ, faithful and true. Jesus Christ, precious and blessed. Jesus Christ, gracious and understanding. Jesus Christ, wondrous and sublime, supreme. Jesus Christ, sinless and mysterious. Jesus Christ, honourable and trustworthy. Jesus Christ, personal, thoughtful, and selfless. Jesus Christ, genuine and honest, virtuous. Jesus Christ, peerless and superb, mighty and renowned. Jesus Christ, humility and grace. Jesus Christ, gentle yet majestic. Jesus Christ, pure and priceless. 
matchless grandeur. Jesus Christ, King of Kings, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus Christ, awesome and inspirational, powerful, fearless. Jesus Christ, triumphant and victorious. Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our coming King, splendour and glory unsurpassed. Jesus Christ, mission accomplished at Calvary. I invite you all to crown him again in your hearts this morning as I also do. And now for Jesus' final dramatic days. I have chosen the Apostle Luke's account, which is almost word for word of the other three Gospel versions, apart from the occasional plus or minus differences. So as something different, I will paraphrase from the KJV account of the happenings at that time and also see how Isaiah's prophecy of those final days match up with the actual account. We take up Luke's story following Jesus' daytime teaching ministry, after which it was his habit to retire to the Mount of Olives. I'm sure it was a beautiful setting in which to daily connect with his father in fervent prayer. Early in the morning on this particular occasion, he set out for the temple where he was confident a crowd of hungry souls would be present again to listen to his words of life. After all, many were by now familiar with his sometimes daily program developed over the previous three and one half years of his personal ministry. So what were they hearing from God's Son this time? I'm sure it makes us all envious. It does me anyway. However, this time was special. It was the Passover feast and highly significant to Jesus. He knew the chief priests and scribes were planning how they could take his life. They feared the people, though, knowing Jesus' popularity with many of them. Meanwhile, Judas, one of the twelve, and the exchequer for the group, allowed Satan to encourage him to betray his Lord and so earn some extra funds on the sideline. So he confers with the chief priests and captains and they strike on a betrayal price and wait for the opportune time to make their move of which the multitude must not be aware. The Passover day had now arrived. The Passover lamb would be slain and made ready. Jesus instructs Peter and John concerning their preparations and place for the 13 to dine following their inquiry. Jesus tells them to proceed to the city where they would come across a man with a pitcher on his shoulder. They were to follow him to where he lived and inquire of him as to where the guest chamber was so that the master could eat the Passover with his disciples. Jesus said the goodman of the house would show them a large upper room, fully furnished and well suited for the occasion. And so the room is prepared and he sat down with the twelve apostles. Jesus addresses the group. 
It is with desire that I have looked forward to eating this special Passover with you all before I suffer, as there will not be any further opportunity until the kingdom of God be fulfilled. Then he took the full cup and gave thanks, passed it to one of the twelve, and told them to divide it among themselves. For the second time he restates his promise to not drink of the fruit of the vine until the fulfilment of his father's kingdom. <coughs> he then takes the bread, gives thanks, breaks it into pieces, and states that what they were about to eat was a symbol of his body, which would later be broken for them. His shed blood for them would also usher in the promised New Testament. Therefore, eat and drink is his invitation to the wall. There is silence now as Jesus prepares the twelve for his next statement. There's a hand on the table with me that belongs to a person who is about to betray me. However, the outcome will not alter my determination to see my assignment through to the end. But woe unto this person who is about to do this dastardly deed. An inquiry erupts among the twelve, which quick, quickly develops into strife over who should be the most important person in the group. Jesus calms them and teaches them a lesson on Gentile lordship, which he said was contrary to a humble spirit that should prevail among them. Now, if you can get this business suited out, sorted out between yourselves and decide on who should be the chiefest, well, let him serve to prove his eligibility. As for me, I wanted to register that I am prepared to serve you all, seeing you have faithfully continued with me in my temptations. Further, my Father has appointed a kingdom unto me, and one day you will eat and drink at my table and sit on thrones in judgment of Israel's twelve tribes. Another drama is about to unfold at the table as Jesus hones in on Simon Peter's weakness. Now, Peter, Satan is hard after you and wants to sift you as wheat. But be assured, though, that I have already prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have become converted, you will be a strength to your brethren. It's beginning to sink in. But Lord, should they put you in prison and condemn you to death, I would want them to do the same with me. I'll give up my life for you if it comes to that. Now, Peter, it's hard for me to say this, but the truth of the matter is, that before the rooster crows, you will have denied three times having known me. There is something else I want to bring to your remembrance. When I sent you all forth without funds, script or shoes, did you lack anything? The disciples responded, no, Lord. Well, right now, if you have a purse and script but no sword, Sell your garment and buy a sword, because what has been written is yet to be accomplished in me, and the end is already in sight. Here are a couple of swords, Lord. Good. That will be sufficient. That is as much as I have to say to you all right now, as I feel compelled to head off to the Mount of Olives. 
His disciples rearrange the large upper room and they all depart. However, Judas slips away on his own. The rest of the group, apart from Jesus, don't seem to have noticed. Jesus arrives at the place he had in mind and suggests that the now eleven should engage in prayer so as to ward off temptation. He then withdraws from them for about a stone's cast and falls on his knees and face in prayer to his Father. Other times at the same place it was a joy to spend hour after hour in dialogue with his Father, but this time it was so different. It was crisis time for him and he was so very aware of his final hour which was almost upon him. So much so that he inquires of his father with regard to the cup he was about to drink. Maybe there is another way my father hasn't thought of that could spare me all this pathos. No, there was no other way. His father's will would prevail. Yes, he was Jesus, yet he still needed that extra strength and his father was well aware of the situation. Suddenly the father sends an angel to give him that added extra strength. Somehow his prayer then becomes more urgent and earnest and such increases his agony. So much so that large drops of blood begin to ooze out from the pores of his skin and facial areas and trickled down to the ground. It's difficult for him to rise from his knees and return to the group. No, they weren't praying. They were sleeping and sorrowful. They now knew from Jesus' bloodied face that something traumatic was taking place. Jesus leaves, leaves them again and urges them to pray so as to withstand temptation. He returns a second time. The scene is no different. He departs and continues his prayer session with his father. It's still unchanged after the third time. They're all sleeping once again, which adds to his disappointment of them. Jesus was still speaking to the eleven when suddenly there is a disturbance nearby. There is much shouting and commotion. At the head of this unruly group there was a person well known to the other disciples. It was this person who had led the chief priests, captains of the temple and elders to Jesus little garden sanctuary. What's more, they were armed with swords and staves and meant business. Jesus addresses Judas, surely you're not going to betray your Lord and Master with an insincere kiss. It's to no avail. He steps forward and does exactly what he had arranged with the angry group. Lord, shall we smite with a sword? Peter, in fact, does, and the high priest's servant is soon missing one of his ears. Jesus restrains the disciples from further aggressive thoughts and takes pity on the servant and replaces his severed ear. An incredible act, considering all the circumstances we would all surely conclude. Jesus speaks up. Why have you all come out against me with swords and staves as if I was a thief? 
Surely you remember my daily visits to the temple. No one had any genuine complaint against me on those many occasions. But it appears that this is your dark hour and the evil power that accompanies it. Jesus is led as a lamb to the slaughter, away, with no resistance whatsoever. The disciples disperse as Jesus is singled out and taken to the palace of Annas the high priest. Peter lingers in the distance. It was a cold evening and some of the crowd light a small open fire in one of the halls of the palace. Peter had separated himself from the rest of the disciples and decides to huddle up with the crowd to get some extra warmth from the fire. He's not keen on being noticed. Nevertheless, he is singled out by one of the maids of the palace as she is certain he was one of the eleven with Jesus. She inquires, but Peter flatly denies her assertion, Woman, I don't know him. Denial number one. It wasn't long, maybe an hour, before someone else also affirmed with confidence that Peter had been one of the Jesus group. I'm not, was the same reply. Denial number two. Yet after some further time had passed, a third person was absolutely confident that Peter was part of them. He's a Galilean, can't you tell? Once again, Peter insists, they must have the wrong person. I just do not know the accused, he angrily responds. And as, as he continues to belittle their judgment, there is an unusual sound in the evening air. A distant rooster had decided on one last crow for the day. The sound easily reaches the group, hunched over the small fire. It was now denial number three. Jesus turned about and looked into the familiar face of Peter. It was a look of sadness and disappointment. He had failed badly for the time being. The crying of the rooster suddenly brought home to him his fragile relationship with the king of the universe. He was devastated and wept bitterly, and as hard as he tried, he could not erase from his mind Jesus' look of disappointment of him. When you are converted, Peter, were the words now flooding into his mind, how true they were. Meanwhile, Jesus is being held, mocked, blindfolded, spat upon and spitten across his face with the palms of the accuser's hands. Which one of us struck you? was the next question they asked him. Prophesy if you can, Jesus. All the while he is being subjected to blasphemy. A new day has dawned and already the elders of the people, chief priests and scribes were busy preparing to lead Jesus to their council. They aren't really all that confident, so they press the question, are you really the Christ? They want a specific answer from him. Jesus can read their thoughts like a book. Now, should I affirm that I am, you wouldn't believe me. And should I ask you to release me, I happen to know that you would not do so. 
Now ponder this. One day you will witness the Son of God seated on the right hand of the power of God. They are still baffled, apprehensive. So they at last ask the question, Are you then the Son of God? Yes, I am. In fact, if I prayed to my Father for help at this very moment, he could send more than 12 legions of angels to my aid. Pilate, the governor, now comes into the picture and addresses Jesus and inquires of him, Are you the Christ? I am. Are you the Son of God? Jesus' answer is the same. King of the Jews' suggestion is also included in Pilate summing up. Jesus by now is bound. Meanwhile, all kind of accusations and untruths about Jesus are being directed to Pilate. He stirs up the Jews from Galilee even to this place. Pilate responds, I cannot find fault with this man. I now find some comfort as he realises that Jesus comes under Herod's jurisdiction and not his. He hopes his involvement in the matter will cease. It was also convenient for him that Herod was in Jerusalem at this very time and was extra keen to see the one he had heard so many sensational stories about. All the time the rabble were clambering for Jesus' blood. Herod's men of war have mocked and ridiculed him as well and placed a scarlet robe around his shoulders and a crown of planted thorns upon his head in preparation of his audience with Herod. But Herod finds no fault with Jesus either and returns him to Pilate. Pilate is somewhat annoyed again and repeats his summing up that he still cannot find fault with him. Certainly nothing worthy of death. I'm going to chastise him as to satisfy you all and then I will release him. The feast was about to commence and one of the customs was to set free one of the prisoners, Barabbas, who was held for sed sedition and murder, would have a rare opportunity to regain his freedom. But the rabble would surely not want him in their midst again. And Jesus was no criminal. So it was put to the rabble to choose decision. Rabbis would be pardoned. Jesus should be crucified, they cried out. Pilate again intervenes for the third time. I can't find any fault as to why he should be put to death. The rabble being stirred up to a frenzy by the chief priests finally succeed in pressuring Pilate to hand Jesus over to them, which he then does. Meanwhile, Pilate's wife sent a message to her husband advising him to cease his involvement in the affair. It had the desired effect. He calls for water to wash his hands in front of the people and states he is innocent of the blood of this just person. The promised scourging of Jesus is meted out to him and his own garments are again placed on his battered and bruised body. There still have been no complaints from his lips as he is finally led away to Golgotha. It soon becomes apparent though that he is too weak and unable to carry the cross that had been laid on him. So a stranger from Cyrene is compelled to bear it for him. 
They reached the designated place at the highest point of a small hill where three holes have already been dug. The two outer holes will be used to take the crosses of two thieves. The middle hole will be reserved for Jesus, the Christ. There was much screaming as the two thieves are pinned to their crosses and roughly plugged into the holes, the outer holes. The middle hole has still not been used. Jesus hears the sounds of agony from the two malefactors, but already he is being prepared to undergo similar treatment. He is laid out naked on a third cross and spikes are driven through his hands and feet to attach him to the timbers. The pain is excruciating. His clothes have been